Buckle up for the ride of your life. Mike's rolling down the Pennsylvania Road tonight on Newswatch 16 at 6. If you want to get someplace in this country, you take the interstates. If you want to see something of this country, you take roads like Route 6 across Pennsylvania. So that's where we'll begin. Judged by many to be one of the most scenic highways in the United States, it runs more or less across the northern tier of Pennsylvania through some mighty interesting places. The Pennsylvania Grand Canyon is near it. Pine Creek boils down through after a heavy rain, making a roaring noise you can hear from the rim, giving those brave enough a canoeing adventure they'll think about every time they dip a paddle in the water. From Colton Point on the west rim, you can see down about a mile and a half or so, then go up the same distance to a place called Harrison Lookout on the opposite side. There are probably people over there looking across at us, amazed by the view. For those stout of heart and limber of limb, there is the chance to visit Little Four Mile Run Falls. You get a different perspective of Little Pine, but we didn't take a look. It is kind of a long walk. Route 6 a road that leads through towns like Port Allegheny and Smithport and leads on to places like Mount Jewett and Hazelhurst, places where you can really see something of the country. Oh, we'll see a few things in the days ahead, I can tell you that, and we'll have some fun, too. We'll do the things of summer out here, and we've got some room if you want to come along for the ride. I'm Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16 rolling down the Pennsylvania Road in McKean County. <laughs> Zippo Lighters in Bradford. It's a huge company that sells its products worldwide. There's a museum inside full of pieces of Zippo's past, and it traces a most interesting history. George Blaisdell started it all in 1932, Seems a friend was using a lighter George thought too cumbersome, not very good looking. Zippo's Howard Fessenmeyer picks up the story. And his friend said, well, geez, if you can do better, won't you build a better one? Mm -hmm. And that he did. Mm -hmm. And that's where the idea came from. So George worked at developing and then manufacturing the Zippo lighter. That design of more than 60 years ago hasn't really changed. Zippo's early growth was steady, but Howard says World War II came along, and that really put Zippo on the map. So from 1942 to 1945, all of the lighters that we produced went to the uh, Quartermaster Corps, mm -hmm. and they in turn made them available to the Army, Marines, Air Force, Navy on a consignment basis, and uh, they were rationed. There were letters of support and congratulations from MacArthur, War correspondent Ernie Pyle thought a Zippo lighter was like a hunk of gold. So the reputation of Zippo was made. This museum covers Zippo's history, showing the high points, things you might find interesting. They used to engrave, then hand airbrush corporate and military orders, but that has become too expensive, Howard says, so the process is no longer used. These are now collector's items. Years ago, George Blaisdell made one extremely important business decision. If a Zippo product doesn't work, it'll be fixed for free. We have never, we have never taken the first penny from anybody to repair a lighter. So 28 people repair or replace 700 lighters a day here now. On a wall in the museum is some of Zippo's best stories. Uh, this is what I like. The cocker spaniel got a hold of that. <laughs> and, and here's a here's a trim box trim shredder. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is my favorite grinding the machine. Grinding machine. It certainly worked. <laughs> there are some wonderful tales of woe on this wall. Zippo lighters, an American story, really. It makes for an interesting stop on our tour of Pennsylvania. 
I'm Mike Stevens, Musewatch 16, rolling down the Pennsylvania Road in Bradford, McKean County. The Penn Brad Oil Museum near Custer City on Route 219. It's a tribute to oil and the people who work the fields. And they never gave up. And they'd drill one dry hole after another, and they'd have great disappointment, but they worked hard and they played hard, and it's a, a type of life that's gone. If you're lucky, Jim Briner will be your guide through a rig that is as much a part of this region's history as a coal mine is to ours. This rig didn't drill as a rotary drill would. Rather, it smashed its way down, doing about 50 feet per day. This is a bit. This is actually what did the drilling. And when, the, when it got out of shape, they'd heat it in a forge, lay it on the, on the anvil. A tool dresser would stand on one side and a driller on the other, and they'd sledge the bit until it just fit into that gauge on the wall. At one time, Jim says, this area pumped out 83% of all oil and gas in the United States. Independent producers grew wells instead of hay. Their cash crop was high quality crude along with natural gas. This museum tells of their way of life. And this is a lazy bench where the driller and the tool dresser used to sit, eat their lunch, do a little whittling, and swap lies. <laughs> Much as some people still do today. <laughs> I've heard that. I understand. Uh -huh. The history of an era is here, but it's not just the bare facts. The stuff of history is all about in this museum. To bring in a well, nitroglycerin, a fairly unstable liquid explosive, was poured into a shell and lowered into the drilled hole. The fuses of two sticks of dynamite in a squib were lit and dropped in after. The explosion created a cavern underground. The oil seeped in and could be pumped out. There's a lunchbox that has a story, too. But on this little tray in here was the dessert, usually a piece of apple pie or something of that nature. Now, if there was a fork or spoon with the pie, you knew everything was all right with the little lady back home. But if that fork or spoon was missing, buddy, you were in trouble. <laughs> The Penn Brad Historical Oil Well and Museum, a place of the past preserved for the present and hopefully the future. I'm Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, rolling down the Pennsylvania Road near Custer City. The Kinzu Bridge State Park. Try not to make a stop here when it rains. If you do, rain may keep you off the bridge over Kinzu Creek and you would miss the view. 2,053 feet long, 301 feet high. Built first in 1882, rebuilt for heavier loads in 1900. The Kinzu is one of those things you look at and ask yourself, how did they do that? On any day, rain or shine, it's quite the sight to see. Here's another scenic wonder in McKean County and actually Warren County too. The Allegheny National Forest and the Allegheny Reservoir in it. A 27 mile lake with 96 miles of shoreline. There is plenty of room to camp, fish, hike, or whatever it is you like to do when you stop to smell the flowers. Mark Goebel, assistant district ranger, says folks are encouraged to use the park and everything it offers. It is, after all, a park that belongs to the people, so we ought to go to it. Mark showed us a few things you'll find at the Rimrock Overlook. Fat Man Squeeze is one. Ooh, take a deep breath. The stonework for this walkway were made out of some of the original homes that were flooded 30 years ago for the, uh, for the dam? dam, yes. So there's a bit of history that we're walking on with our feet. Once at the bottom, you're not really at the bottom. There's still several hundred feet to go to the lake. But you do have a chance to see, actually, a cross-section of rock coming to the area. Look up, but don't lean back too far. There is also a curious feature hidden among these huge cliffs, one you 
might not notice till you walked past and felt the cold. There, there's an ice bed in there that would be below freezing and it'll stay that way all summer long it never thaws out and it's well into the interior there you really can't crawl into it indians did mark said and kept their perishables quite cold and safe in here unique and interesting these two places oh and they're free well we must move along places called sharon and kennywood and trough creek are ahead so much to see, so little time. I'm Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, rolling down the Pennsylvania Road in McKean County. We traveled a lot during our time on the Pennsylvania Road, well over a thousand miles, in fact. It surprised me what we found at nearly each turn, such variety. Even old ground like that of the town of Hermitage offered something worth stopping for. Here's the avenue of 444 flags that fly all the time. On windy days, you can hear the flags a block away. Each day hostages were held in Iran, a new flag was put up. Hermitage gained national fame because of it. When the hostages came home, the flag stayed. In the park where they wave, a flame now also burns. There's a plaque here from the people of the Scranton area, a tribute to the folks of Hermitage. Many of the flags are now flown in memory of people passed on, people in the military. All these flags flying proudly at once in one place. I doubt anyone could ever get tired of looking. I'm Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, rolling down the Pennsylvania Road in Hermitage. The showroom of the Wendell August Forge, the oldest continuous operating forge in America, and it's in a town called Grove City. This is a place where craftsmanship is the norm, where good enough is never good enough. They let you tour the shop during regular working hours, and if you don't mind loud noise, you can see how it all gets done. Len Youngo is a master engraver. If you're familiar with sculpting, this is essentially sculpting only in reverse. What we're doing is sculpting this image into the die, and this acts as a mold. Now, when this mold is done, we can make all our product from it. Len actually works in reverse. Everything he cuts into a steel block is opposite. Hold a greeting card up to a mirror. The reflected image would be engraved by Len, but it would also have depth so that the finished piece would be three-dimensional. Something like this, this took me three days to do. Now, I have done some dies that have taken me a half an hour and others that have taken me a month. When Len has finished his work, the die is taken to the floor and the rest of the process begins. The piece of metal is hammered into the die, taking on the engraved image, like pressing silly putty onto your palm and getting a palm print. Because of the creative process throughout, no two pieces made here can be identical. As the metal goes through the work area, each person along the way adds an individual touch because each step is done by hand. There is character and charm and a subtle glow to these metal works of art. They are most delightful to look at, and so we shall. These are remarkable creations, I thought, coming as they do from cold, hard metal. They seem to breathe, to have life, to make you almost part of the scene. They are pieces that will last several lifetimes, pieces your kids and their kids will enjoy. Value comes from craftsmanship, I've heard it said. And here at Wendell August Forge, that is certainly true. I'm Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, rolling down the Pennsylvania Road in Grove City.